Well, my name is, again, Adam Knowles. I'm the junior high pastor, and um, I get the opportunity to be here with you today. And um, we're going to spend a lot of our time in Romans chapter 6. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take it out. And I'm the kind of guy, I like to take notes, and so I hope to provide notes for you. So if you have a pen and paper, why don't you go ahead and take that on out too. But we just got done with a really, really great series. Would you agree with me on that? Walk the line. Anybody enjoy Walk the Line? Right on. And then a lot of you, it was so cool seeing all y'all at Wednesday night and hanging out. That's, that's my night, and it was good seeing you guys. And so um, I hope you guys had fun. And interestingly enough, we wrapped up the series with expectations, and it made me go back and kind of remember the, the expectations that I had going into marriage and, you know, kind of being able to have my wedding day and my wedding night. Like, I was just excited about it. And there was one thing, though, that ended up happening that I wasn't expecting because the night of my wedding night, I learned that I married a sleepwalker, unfortunately. Yeah, I married a sleepwalker, and she's here today, and I got permission to use these stories, so for all you concerned ones out there, don't worry. Like, I, I, got, I got the go-ahead, but yeah, I, I, I married a sleepwalker, and so the night of our wedding, um, it's probably like 2, 3 in the morning, and I wake up to somebody trying to get out of our double glass doors in our hotel room, and I wear contacts, so I can't see very well, especially at night, and I realize, oh, it's a little person, so it's probably my wife, like, we're probably good, I, I'm not, not safe, and I say, love, what are you doing? And she turns around, and she looks at me and says, my sandals are in the garden, and I need them. <laughs> and, and so in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, we're on the second floor, so that wouldn't work well. Uh, and there was not a garden, nor did she have her sandals, so I thought, maybe it was just the Taco Bell speaking, maybe it was just an off night, and... Fast forward a little bit, though, into a few months in, and we're in our apartment, and it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and my wife is going through the cupboards, and me being the guy that I am, I'm like, sweet, late night snack, I'm okay with this. And so I sit up, and, and, and she's not really making a whole lot of sense, and so I call her over, and I say, love, what are you doing? And she says, just put the clear on the potatoes. And much like a lot of you trying to figure out what exactly that meant, I say, what are you talking about? She goes, just put the clear on the potatoes, and everything will be fine. And then she lays her head on the pillow, and then she just knocks out. In the beginning of our marriage, we got to do ministry in Oklahoma. And by this time, I just started having fun with it because I learned that, hey, you know, it's part of the deal. And so I wake up, and she's doing laps around our master bedroom and say, love, what is it this time? And she goes, I'm checking the consistency of the house. And my response was just, is it consistent? Are we good? One day we woke up and there were leaves and branches in her hair, which led us to believe that our sleepwalking endeavors took her outdoors. So we got her one of those bracelets that said, return here if found. Um, but the worst one ever, the worst one was that I literally woke up. I woke up to my wife, y'all, standing over me in bed and... I, I wake up and I look at her and she's just going, do you hear it? Do you hear it? Do you hear it? And the first thing that goes through my mind in this moment is this is how I'm going to die. Like, I'm going to die right now. I'm not going to make it. Like, this is, this is the worst. And ended up getting her back to bed and in the morning I changed the will. And so um, everything's fine now. But I married a sleepwalker. And, and what's interesting is that when, you, when you're an individual who's learning what a sleepwalker is, at first when you're on the outside looking in, you notice that things are a little bit off. You notice that they're functioning, but the functioning is a little bit different. And uh, it's just not really quite lining up and it's not really quite making sense. And what I've learned over the years of being in ministry and for the years that I've been a Christ follower myself is that Every single one of us in this room are probably in either one of three stages in our lives and particularly in our walks with God. We're either spiritually dead or sleepwalking, not kind of just roaming around. We're awake or aware or we're completely and fully alive. And for some of us this morning, we might think that we are in one category, but in the end we might realize that we're, we're in another and Paul, in the beginning of Romans chapter 6, is writing to his audience because he, 
like many who have had to deal with any type of sleepwalkers, noticed that something was a little bit off in the way that people were going about their lives. Something was a little bit different. They were functioning, but not functioning at their fullest. And so as he writes Romans, he's writing to an audience who is trying to distinguish the difference between how to live my life under law and how to live my life under grace. And so as an attempt to kind of clear the air and to have it be very clear, he writes this to them. Now, in the beginning of this chapter specifically, he starts it off interestingly. Um, He says, what shall we say then? Verse 1. Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? And he says, no, 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 by no means We are those who have died to sin, so how can we live in it any longer? And if you stop really fast and backtrack to Romans chapter 5, basically what he's kind of going through, at the end of that chapter, he talks about how every single person born on this side of Adam is born into Adam's sin. He inherits that sin. So in the beginning, God created man, and then man in Genesis chapter 3 messed it up, and that sin caused separation between man and God. And so he says every single person born is born into that sin. And the only way to be able to bridge that gap is through this relationship with Jesus and to be able to tap into his grace. But what was happening was that the grace that was being provided was kind of being taken advantage of a little bit. And so he says, so, so what shall we say? Should we just keep on sinning so that God's grace just keeps happening? And he's saying, no. Now let me ask you, what's one thing that you're not supposed to do as a sleepwalker? not supposed to wake them up, right? Because they freak out or you might like get punched in the face or something like that. But Paul doesn't care. He's saying right now, no, you guys, this is not how it ought to be. This is not how it ought to be. And one thing that I know for sure is that I, I do not know where each of us stand in our walk with God or whether or not we have one. But some traits that I could think of when it comes to this idea of being a sleepwalker or being spiritually dead would be something like this, where church or faith is merely just like a a hobby or a social meetup than it is an actual way of life. Or maybe um, you you might consider yourself a Christian, but non-Christians act just as Christian as you do. And so when you were to look at it, there's not really much of a comparison there. Or maybe you're here this morning, you got a drug problem, which I mean, you were drug here this morning and You thought that you were going to Mimi's Cafe, and you're like, wait, we passed it like 10 minutes ago, right? And and you're just getting pulled here for whatever reason. Or maybe you're here, and you don't have any desire to have any relationship with God at all. And if that's you, and you're in that category, I just want you to know that this is just an awesome weekend to be a part of, because God desires more for each and every one of his people that he has created than to simply just be sleepwalking or spiritually dead through life. That when he created you, he saw and sees in you the potential that you have and desires to pull out of you more than you could ever imagine. And so he goes on in in verse 3. And he's talking to them a little bit more specifically. So we're not going to keep sinning so that grace can keep happening. He says, no, by no means, by no means, because we shouldn't live in it any longer. So verse three goes, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized into his death? He says that we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And he's kind of backtracking to what it is that that Jesus had done. And he's saying, listen, just as Jesus had died and been buried and he was risen again, you too get to take part in that. And that through baptism, you signify that you have been put to death your old ways and that you've been washed clean and risen anew in who Jesus is and what he's done for you. So he's saying, don't live like that anymore. There's a very clear distinction that he is attempting to make. And basically what he's saying is that if we are going to consider ourselves dead to sin, if we're going to consider ourselves being non-spiritually dead, then why in the world would we live as if we were not alive? Why in the world would we continue to live in the way that we had lived before? And so it's important for us to be able to consider making this transition of being spiritually dead or sleepwalking to becoming more awake. Or maybe another word to use for it would be aware, that we're aware of what it is that God has done. 
And maybe we're not ready to take that step into fully committing our life to him, but we can at least acknowledge the fact that there's a God that does exist and maybe there's something in it for me. If you're in a spot where you're not too sure as to whether or not this whole God thing is for you, I'd like you to consider a a quote with me this morning. It's by this theologian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, which by the name itself, you know it's valid. And the quote goes like this, those who believe obey, and those who obey believe. And so you might, it's pretty easy to understand that if somebody says that they believe something, that they're going to obey whatever it is that they say that they believe. And so whatever you don't obey, you're pretty much saying that you don't believe. But if you're having an issue with the faith thing, this second part of the quote that's the other side to the same coin to say that those who obey believe is saying, listen, why don't you just for a little while try to obey the things that God has laid out for you. Watch as God continues to build his track record by your obedience and then your faith will come as a result of that because you'll learn that you are serving a God who is trustworthy and who follows through when he says he's going to follow through. And so if you like writing things down, um, this is the time where we'll be able to do that together. Like I said, I love taking notes, and so I love providing notes. But if you want to write down how to become awake, so how to get to the point where you're just sleepwalking or spiritually dead, unaware, maybe apathetic to who Jesus is, to becoming a little bit awake. And the first one is to live in the reality of life dead to sin. Romans 6, 6 says, um, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anybody who has died has been set free from sin. I can put it to you like this way. I have a son. He's about six years old. He's got a severe, severe, severe peanut allergy, like life-threatening uh, to the point where um, his last kind of episode was, he was like three and a half and um, his throat closed in a matter of a minute by eating a jelly bean that touched a Reese's wrapper. Um, So pretty intense and crazy. Um, But here's the thing. My son has asked me before, Dad, when I go to heaven, will I be able to have peanut butter, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, the peanut butter and jelly and the Reese's and the Reese's pieces. But like, here's the thing. He is attracted to the very thing that can kill him. And the same goes with us in our human nature. We are attracted to the things that can kill us. And so we have to walk in life in this reality of being dead to sin, that it's no longer anymore a thing that we are, that we don't have to be weighed down by it, that we don't have to live life in it, that it is something that we are completely done and separate from. And so we need to be aware, though. I mean, for my wife and I, it's uh, calling ahead to friend hangouts to make sure that they put the peanut butter away. It's telling our kid to be, his name is Hudson, not just kid, uh, to be able to be aware of the things that he needs to be aware of. It takes that time and effort to say, I need to separate myself from these things that can harm me. We must do the same. Second is that we must live life in the reality of life with Christ. Romans 6, 8 says, Now if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. When he died, he died once for all. And I think for a lot of us, what it makes us a little bit apprehensive about taking that step from death into life, from a life without Christ to a life with Christ, is that we would have to do it alone. That maybe the guilt and the shame has isolated us to a point so long that we perceive ourselves as lower than dirt when God himself sees you as his adored son or daughter. And the reality of the situation is when we take that step from death into life and we get to have life with God is that we have him there with us. So that when we don't have what it takes, we can rely on the power that Jesus possesses to take us there. Then when we feel like we're running out of energy, that we could tap into the supernatural energy that Christ has to offer each and every one of us, we do not have to do it alone. And as we continue to do life with Christ, we get to tap into this wonderful way that he got to communicate with his father and this third idea of living life in the reality of a life for God. Everything Jesus did, he did for God, not by man, but for God. And it says the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. And here, listen, 
I had asked myself the same question before I got up in front of each and every one of you, but my question for you is, how much of your life are you living for God versus for yourself? I remember like early on in being married, I I probably had like 93% of my life lived for God and 7% I kind of held on to and man, did that 7% really weigh me down. And my question for you and those things that you're holding on to and are maybe not yet giving over to God, my question is, how's that going for you? And what could potentially happen if you decided to hand those things over? If what you know about God is true, man, what are some of the things that could happen as a result of that? Some traits of just being awake or aware of who God is and what he's done is is maybe this. Maybe you attend church somewhat regularly. Um, but it's not really high on the priority list. And so a lot of things come in the way and, oh, we could just miss a weekend, miss a weekend, miss a weekend. Maybe not taking that step, offering more than you currently are. Maybe if you're in the younger generation, you're one of those who posts an encouraging Bible verse every once in a while. But the root of those posting that, that, that verse is to get the attention and get the likes. Or, you know, my, my favorite ones are the, uh, the pictures of the Bible and the feet. And it's solo time with Jesus and all my followers. Maybe that's you. Or maybe, maybe people know that you're a follower of Jesus because of maybe like that you've said it, that you've got a license plate rim that says, I love Jesus, and like a fish on your bumper sticker, and you're even so bold to put that you go to Hillside because you've got the sticker as well. Maybe that's you, and if that's you, that's fine. That's good. It's, it's an okay place to be, but God wants more. He doesn't want you to be spiritually dead. He doesn't want you to be simply awake or aware. He desires for each and every one of us to be fully alive in the individual that he has called us to be. In Romans 6.11, kind of just lays it out, says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. He's made this whole case. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Alive to God in Jesus Christ. It's that next step. And again, if you're writing things down, write down the phrase, how to become alive And the first one is to familiarize yourself with sin. You got to familiarize with yourself with sin. So you got to live life in reality of being dead to it, but now you got to familiarize yourself with it. Romans 6, 12 goes like this. It says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. You think about a king, and if a king is a good king, the king is going to be aware of who the enemy is, how the enemy would attack, how big the enemy is, where the enemy is possibly located, so that this king could be both on the offensive and defensive just in case. And so for each and every one of us, we need to be aware of those things in our lives, aware of the weak spots that we have in order that we may combat it well. Because here's the reality of the situation is that when you've said yes to Jesus, you have automatically become a threat to the enemy. And the moment that we become a threat to the enemy, the enemy will do anything in its power to be able to take us off track or off course in that righteousness that God so desires for us to pursue. So we have to familiarize ourselves with this sin. Secondly, is that we need to offer ourselves to God. You need to offer yourself to God. Romans 6, 13, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. That part's done. But rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. We talk about the fact that we serve a God who has the power to be able to defeat death. And so if we serve a God who's got the power to be able to defeat death, anything else that comes up in our lives is probably pretty minuscule compared to defeating death. And so if we're walking in that reality of life with Christ and for God, then we ought to offer every single part of ourselves as an instrument of righteousness, knowing that at the end of the day, we've got a God who has conquered death on our side. That we're able to go about anything and everything in full knowledge in the fact that the victory is already in the bag and is not going to be dependent on whether or not I get it right the first time as to how God's glory gets revealed. So that we ought to offer ourselves to him fully. And then thirdly, propel forward in his grace. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. 
And if you circle back around to verse 1 where he's talking about should we continue to sin so that his grace abounds, he's saying, no, no, no. The grace thing is great, and it's there, and it's good. But maybe for us this morning, we can consider it this way, to consider grace more as a safety net than a security blanket. That rather than just holding on to God's grace and saying, ah, he'll forgive me, he'll forgive me, we try to justify maybe the decisions that we make just because we know that God's going to forgive us tomorrow, but instead to be able to utilize it as a safety net that as we try our best to pursue righteousness and pursue Jesus and everything that we can, that when, not if we fall, that we've got God's grace there to not only catch us, but to propel us forward in the direction that we ought to go. He's saying that's the way that we ought to consider his grace. That's the way that we ought to take advantage of the fact that he's loved us so much that he would send his son to die for us. Now, some traits of being alive, some things to consider. One, if you're doing like the the great commandment really well, love God and love people. And over the last couple of weeks, we talked about how the vertical relationship with God is how we can go about our horizontal relationships with one another. And that if we do not and have not taken the steps to be able to fully not only accept God's love, but to express God's love, then we are actually doing a disservice to those around us. And some of us in this room are really good at loving God, but not the greatest at loving people. And some of us are really good at loving people, but we don't really have a good relationship with God. But wherever you're at on that spectrum, consider two things for me. One, my encouragement to you when it comes to um, like loving other people in Jesus' name, um, just don't be weird about it. And I don't know how else to explain it other than don't be weird Just be you. God created you. And there's things about you that other people are going to benefit from. Uh, Not a great opening line for like meeting your neighbor is, hello, my name is Adam Knowles and I'd like to tell you about Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Like that could work because God is big enough, but it usually like maybe it doesn't go that way just where we're at in this day and age. But maybe an encouragement to you would be this. If you're feeling like I don't know how to do that well would be to love people until they ask you why. You just keep loving people and loving people and if you're so worried about, oh, the Jesus conversation, one day, if you keep loving them, they're gonna say, what's your deal? Everybody loses patience with me and yet you're patient with me. Everybody leaves me and yet you're still here. What is your deal? And you're able to say, well, my God is patient with me. So of course I'm gonna be patient with you. My God is here with me, so I'm gonna be here with you and then the conversation happens a little more naturally, but great commandment. Love God. Love people. Second is the great commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And my question for you when it comes to this and this idea of making disciples is, if you were to look behind you this morning, who would be following you like you're following Jesus? Who would be behind you following you because you've said, hey, I've noticed things about you that are awesome. I have a little bit of experience in life. Why don't, you, why don't you follow me as I follow Jesus? And for many of us, it's not even on our radars. But God so desires for that to happen that he would desire to use you, yes, even you, to pour into his people. One of the best ways that God's, God speaks to his people is through his people. And he desires to use you. Another one to consider in being fully alive is this idea of generosity. And a lot of the times generosity is thought of in like time and in money, but it's so much bigger than that. It's your talents and your gifts and your abilities and your availability and everything in between. But when it comes to time and looking at this idea of serving, I know that our schedules are busy, but here is another reality to consider is that our schedules reflect our priorities. And the the reality is that God has called each of his people to serve within the church and the community and in the world. And, And my encouragement to you would be to take that step back and to be able to decipher whether or not the current schedule that you have is one that possesses enough margin to be able to serve maybe an hour commitment a week. Because there's no better way to get connected here into the church than to be able to serve alongside like-minded individuals who uh, are pursuing the same thing. And probably some of the best stories that some of your friends here have are from serving one another. 
And there's plenty of ways for you to be able to do that. And then on the, the other end is the, the, the money side of it. And sometimes the money side gets a little bit like kind of uh, weird to talk about, but it's, it's really not. Because I remember when I was a, um, uh, in college, I went to Vanguard University and I was in a spiritual disciplines class. And one of my professors said, your tithe is a direct representation of your relationship with Jesus. And I remember sitting there going, nah, <laughs> it's like, you don't know me. You don't know. And he went on and didn't just leave it there, but basically said, no, listen, Christ loves the church. And, and, and he died so that the church may, you know, that he could take our sins and that the, the way that he kind of went out about it thereafter was through the church. And he said, listen, the tithe is what's set up so that the church can continue. And so if you're for Jesus, then you're for the church. And if you're for the church, then this, this act of worship and tithing is something that's important with a cheerful heart. And one of the best ways that I could describe it is this, is um, I like to get my son French fries from McDonald's every once in a while. And every single time I'll give my son French fries, but I'll ask for one. And I remember almost every single time he goes, no, they're mine, right? And so I'm sitting there having just bought those French fries going, listen, fool, here's the deal, Okay. <laughs> Here's the deal. Those are my French fries that I bought that I'm giving you. So they're my French fries. But how awesome would it be if when I gave my son those French fries that he said, Dad, thank you for these French fries. Would you like to have one? I'd be like, yeah. I'd be so excited. And I think that that's just kind of the picture that I imagine. Like God says, listen, I've blessed you with this and this, this is mine that I'm giving you. And how awesome would it be for us to be able to say, God, thank you. Here's yours, and to be able to go from there. These ideas of being alive, that's what God desires from each of us. Now again, I don't know where you're at in your relationship with God. I don't know how things have been for you. I don't know what the last year has looked like. Even as we have gone into the opportunity to see baptisms over the last few weeks and see the stories that have come as a result, I understand that things are, are crazy and life is real and there is no getting around that. But I have a little bit of encouragement for you this morning and the reality is that you don't have to go from just like being spiritually dead to awake and aware and then eventually to alive. You have an opportunity to go from death to life. Because of who God is and what he's done, you get the opportunity to be able to go from completely spiritually dead to fully and vibrantly alive. And the best part of it is that it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with how much your heavenly father loves you. Paul in Romans 6, he fast forwards a little bit to verse 22. So he makes this whole case talks about how we ought to do life with, with Jesus and dead to sin and for God and that, you know, we, we should really start looking at God's grace as what it is and then he wraps it up beautifully with this. But now that you have been set free from sin and you've become slaves of God, listen, the benefit that you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's the deal, y'all. We, God created man, and man messed up. And because sin entered into the picture, God being in his perfect state could no longer be around his creation. And God didn't want it that way, and so he initiated this redemptive plan that over centuries and time and time and time that he eventually got to the point where he sent his son, Jesus, fully God, fully human, to be able to go and die on our behalf because the consequence of being physically dead and spiritually dead is life eternal without God. Some people call that hell, and it's not what God designed, it's not what God wanted. So he sent his son to be able to take the weight of sin on his own shoulders by dying on that cross. And just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter, where we celebrated his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And it's because he defeated death that you and I have that opportunity to be able to now spend an eternity with the very God who created you in the first place. And the only thing that he requires of us is to confess with our mouth and to believe in our heart that he did what he said he did and he's gonna do what he said he's gonna do. 
And sometimes that's a little bit of a hard thing to imagine and to kind of take in. And so maybe kind of go on this journey with me. Close your eyes really fast. Don't fall asleep, but just close your eyes. Imagine it pictured this way. You're in a movie theater. The lights go off and the screen goes on. And all of a sudden you notice up on the screen something all too familiar. In fact, it's the... It's every single sin that you've committed from the time you were born up until now. And it's just screens all over the place and screens all over the place. And you feel that weight of like, oh, I don't like that. But it's okay because you're in the theater alone, but all of a sudden you hear the door open and you realize that, oh man, Jesus himself walking in the theater, he sits down two rows behind me and he's watching the same things that are on the screen and all these thoughts start going through your head. All these thoughts start going through your head and finally you muster up the courage to be able to look over your shoulder and you make eye contact with Jesus. And my question for you this morning is, what would the look on Jesus' face be when you make eye contact with him from what's up on that screen? Now open your eyes. And here's a reality that I really want you to understand. I really want you to get. Because I've done this with a lot of people. had this done to myself. And the words that come into my brain and other people's brains are things like disgust and embarrassment. And you could do better and you should do better. And he'd be embarrassed. Everything in between. But whatever those negative things are, I need you to hear this. Is that when God looks at you, he always has, he always does and forever will look at you with complete adoration as his beloved son or daughter. And there's nothing that you can do to make God love you less or more and he's going to love you and there's nothing that you can do about it. And what God desires to do by sending his son is for his son to essentially stand up in front of that screen so that when God is looking at you, he sees you through the righteousness of his son. And it's through that relationship that you have an opportunity to experience life eternal. But you got to make that step. And we're going to give you an opportunity to do that this morning. Maybe for the first time this morning, you're realizing that it's time to take that step from being dead to alive. And we're going to pray a prayer together. And this prayer is for any of you who, for the very first time, this is actually making sense, that you've not made that decision to follow Jesus before. That you've come in today with a lot of weight, a lot of baggage that God so desires to take you from and free from you. This, pray that, this prayer that we're about to pray is, is basically just a confession uh, uh, with our mouths and in our hearts saying how much we need God and acknowledging the fact that we cannot do it ourselves. And so if you would mind joining me in that prayer, it'll be up on the screen. But it goes like this. It says, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask you for forgiveness. I I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Guide my life and help me to do your will. In your name, amen. Now here's the thing. For some of you in this room right now, you've made the bold step and you've taken that decision to follow Jesus for the very first time. Meaning before this, you would be what was considered spiritually dead, and you've taken that leap into life. About a year ago at Easter, we started an initiative about um, taking another bold step and taking the step to be able to stand in front of everyone here and say as loud as you can, I believe, so that we can all be a part of your day and vice versa, and that we can celebrate with you. That today on May 6, 2018, your life has changed. And we desire to celebrate that with you. And so in a moment, I'm going to give you the floor that if you made that decision for the very first time to live your life and accept Jesus, that you would stand and you would say, I believe. So for us in this room, as God has been working on our hearts before we, can, before we even step foot on this campus, if today was your day where you accepted Jesus, would you be bold enough to stand and say, I believe Silence doesn't bother me. (laughs) If God is working on your heart and today's that day, we want to celebrate with you.
Bless you. Let's, if you wouldn't mind staying standing and we'll hold our applause to the, to the end if anybody else. See you. I know, we just can't help but clap. I get it. See you. Hmm. Anyone else? Hey, let's give it up for these guys. First of all, you guys can have a seat. You guys can have a seat now. And hey, I tell you what, when when the gathering is done, we encourage you to head over. Um, on either end of the room to be able to connect with our team because we would love to get to know you and we would love to be able to pray with you. And hey, if you're sitting here right now and you've not yet made that decision, but today was not the day for you, just know that like, that's okay. And we're just really excited that you've decided to kind of do life with us. And we look forward to and quite honestly anticipate the day where we get to celebrate with you. For those of you who've stood up, um, I just want you to know, get connected. We've got that baptism class coming up May 16th. We've got a Next Steps track starting back up in June. And if you're not a part of a group, head to our website and get a part of a Circle Up group because we are excited to do life with you. So welcome to the family. Would you all mind praying with me as we get on with the rest of our day? God, thank you so much for your redemptive power and what you are capable of. God, we thank you for meeting our friends here this afternoon that you would be so gracious, God, to allow them to be um, freed and lifted of whatever it is that might have been holding them down. God, that your grace and who you are has uh, superseded that, God. We thank you for calling us to live a life fully alive in you. God, and we eagerly anticipate what it is that you have in store for people just like us. God, we love you, and it's in your name we pray.